Hello, friends, and welcome to our 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are in lesson number 13 of the book of Ephesians. We actually have 14 lessons in this particular Sabbath School study. Lesson number 13, waging peace. It's going to be a good one. It's focusing on Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Now, we covered those verses in our last Sabbath school study, but we're going to cover them again in even more detail, focusing on those individual weapons. I am joined by our 3ABN Sabbath school panel family. To my immediate left, Jill Marconi. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I have Monday, the belt and breastplate. Mm, that's going to be good. And Pastor John Denzi. I have uh, Tuesday, shoes, the church wages peace. Amen. And to your left, Shelly Quinn. Oh, and I have the shield, the helmet, and the sword, and I can't wait. Amen. And to your left, Daniel Perrin. Yes, I have Thursday's lesson, the final weapon, practicing battlefield prayer. Amen. Amen. So you can see we're looking at the individual weapons that are part of the armor of God. Now, in our last study, we talked about the, the battle itself, but now we're going to hone in on the specifics of these weapons that God has given us. Of course, before we do that, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask Daniel if you'd like to pray for us. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, your word gives us wisdom for every situation that we face. Right now, we know that we cannot face those situations without each of the gifts and the tools that you've made available for us. As we study them and understand them, help us to put them to use through your spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we are in Sabbath lesson. We're going to be looking for this week's lesson study at Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20, at 1 Peter 4, verse 1, and 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Isaiah chapter 59, 17, and Isaiah 52, 8 through 10, as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Right now, we're going to land back in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 16 and 17, looking at the ESV. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In John Bunyan's devotional classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, written while he was in jail, Christian is led into a palace armory and shown all manner of furniture, which the Lord had provided for pilgrims as a sword, a shield, a helmet, a breastplate, all prayer and shoes that would not wear out. And there was here enough of this to harness or fit a man or many men for the service of the Lord as be the stars in the heavens for multitudes, unquote. Before Christian departs, he is again uh, led into the armory where they harnessed or fitted him from head to foot with all that he would need that would give him proof or make him impenetrable, lest perhaps he should meet with the assaults in the way. Bunyan's writing in the 1678 recalls a document written some 1600 years earlier by the Apostle Paul, the epistle to the Ephesians, also composed in a prison. It is the great missionary apostle. Uh, in it, the great missionary apostle imagines a great army, the church visiting God's armory and suiting up with the divine coverings, the, the, the armor that they need. From head to toe, God's armory holds enough of the finest weaponry for every soldier in his army to be clad Amen. with northern steel from top to toe, quote unquote, as, set, as they set forth to wage peace. I love that title, to wage peace. It's, it's unsuspecting, but yet it fits so powerfully with yes. the whole theme of Ephesians chapter 6 and what it is that God is calling us to do. And that is to take the gospel to the world, the gospel of peace, the peace of Jesus Christ to all the world. But it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual war. Now, I don't know how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress, but it's a powerful book. Uh, a lot of illustrations there that, that help us to understand the Christian war walk, the journey that we're taking. And indeed, he is borrowing from the Bible. Specifically, in this depiction, he is borrowing from Ephesians chapter 6. And it's amazing to me to think that John Bunyan was in a jail, and of course, Paul was in a jail when he wrote Ephesians chapter 6. The two of them inspired by God. I can't imagine what it would be like to be put in prison or put in jail for any long amount of time, especially for your faith. And yet, God was there. 
you know, John wrote the book of Revelation in jail. He was in jail on the Isle of Patmos. So it was a little bit more expansive in a sense, but he was still in prison nonetheless. And there God visited him also and inspired him with the book of Revelation. Sunday's lesson is entitled, The Church, A Unified Army. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. What is Paul saying about the kind of warfare that the church is engaged in? Is Paul primarily depicting just an individual believer's spiritual battle, the quarterly goes on to say, against evil, or the church's corporate war against evil? Now, we may have seen this as an individual only battle, but it could also represent the church as a whole. This individual that is putting on this armor could be a similar representation of the whole church body. That's the way we can see it. Victory in the Greek, the, the quarterly goes on to say, in Roman warfare was dependent on the cooperation of the soldiers in a military unit and especially in their support for each other in the heat of the battle. In a war, individualism in battle was regarded as a characteristic of barbarian warriors dooming them to defeat. So you see this picture, and it's been developing all through the book of Ephesians. You see this picture of unity. You see this picture of a church body united under Christ who is the head. Now that doesn't mean that at times God's army is individuals. Uh, often it's necessary to stand alone. Yet, we must remember that while Elijah or Elisha or Jonathan and his armor bearer or Samson or Moses or Aaron or Daniel or Jacob of Joseph or even Jesus stood without armies, they had the armies of heaven enlisted yes. in their support. Yes. You remember the story of that young prophet? Well, he was the servant of a prophet. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. Let's just take a look there at these verses. Uh, Elisha is training, right? He's got the school of the prophets. He's, he's, uh, he's there in uh, Dothan and he's doing uh, an intensive. He's doing an intensive training there in Dothan with, with, the, with the students in the school, at least one of the students in the school. And it says here in verse 12 of 2 Kings chapter 6, and one of his servants said, uh, none, my lord or king. Now, okay, let me just back up here and give you the, uh, the context of the story. So the king of Syria is asking his servants, how come every time I go somewhere, uh, they already know that I'm coming. These, the, the Israelites already know that I'm coming. They already know I'm going to be. Which one of you is, is a spy for the king of Israel? And they say, n his servants say, none, my lord, O king, but Elijah, the prophet that is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. Now, of course, we know only God can do that. And we need to remember this as we think about this battle that we're in because God sees all things, he knows all things. And God can equip us to meet the enemy and to hinder his movements or be prepared for his movements before, without him even knowing that we're prepared before they even happen. And that's what the book of Revelation is really all about. Uh, it tells us what the movements of the enemy are before they even come so that we can be prepared. The book of Revelation isn't to prepare us, it's to, uh, to scare us, it's to prepare us, it's to get us ready. And so Israel was prepared for the movements of the Syrian king because of the prophet Elisha. And he said, verse 13, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, behold, he is in Dothan, verse 14. Therefore sent he thither, this is the king of Syria, horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and they surrounded the city about. And when the servant of the man of God, now here's the student that's in the school of the prophets and he's going to go through an intensive right now. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host surrounded the city, both with horses and with chariots. And this student, this servant said to, Eli to Elisha, alas, my master, how shall we do? What's going to happen to us? What are we going to do? In verse 16, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You see, when you're on the Lord's side, you are always in the majority. Amen. You may be by yourself, but you are always in the majority. Now, it was just Elijah and this young man, basically. I mean, there were, there were other people in the city, but, but this young man was thinking about, you know, there's just us, Master. What are we going to do? There's just me and you. And, and so Elijah prays, verse 17, Elijah prays. And 
In our last meeting, our last study uh, in, the, in the Sabbath School quarterly, uh, Pastor John Lomaking talked about the three things that we can prepare. You know, you go out singing and you can prepare through prayer and then, of course, repentance and preparing your heart for battle. These are the three things we can do. And so Elijah, the first thing he does when he prepares for battle is he prays. And of course, that's part of the armor. And he said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was what? It was full of horses and chariots and fire round about Elisha. Our eyes need to be opened and we need to see that God has surrounded us with his angels, that the angels of the Lord encampeth about those that fear him, that God has given angels to bear us up in their hands lest we dash our feet against a stone, Psalm 91. So there are important reasons to support the idea that Paul, in line with this usual military understanding, is also addressing the church's shared battle against evil. It's not just a singular battle, it's a shared battle. Remember Elijah, who stood alone, said, I'm the only one left. And what did God say? There's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. We may not see them, right? They not, may not be visible to us, but with our spiritual eyes, we can believe that. Many times people say, oh, the church is in apostasy. I say, oh, really? There's 20 million people in the church. Have, do you know them all personally? Have you visited them? Do you know what their spiritual condition is? Because we're not talking about buildings and institutions here. We're talking about people. God has his 7,000 friends. So yes, the passage is the climax of a letter that is all about the church. So it would be strange for Paul to conclude his letter with a picture of a lone Christian and not continue that theme of a church body in this battle against the foes of darkness. And at the end of the passage, Paul highlights Christian camaraderie and is called a prayer for all the saints. So that's another reason we could see this as a bigger picture than just individualism. And most significant of all, earlier in the letter when Paul discusses the power of evil, he places them over and against the church not individual believers, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be, might be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places, mm -hmm. Ephesians 3, verse 10. I think there's a strong evidence here for the corporate application, right? The corporate language, the brethren, the we in verses 10 and 12 is also there. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 portrays both the solidarity of a lone warrior confronting evil and the church as an army. He calls us individually and corporately to take up the full armor as a unified army with heaven, vigorously and unitedly pressing the battle. Paul chooses to conclude his thoroughgoing emphasis on the church, which he had, which had included the sustained descriptions of the church as a body of Christ, as the building, the temple of God, as the bride of Christ. You mentioned that in our last study with this final metaphor, the church as the army of the living God, an army with banners going forth, conquering and to conquer. Since we are approaching the evil day, Ephesians 6, 13, the final stages of the long running battle against evil, it is no time to be fuzzy about our individual commitment to God as well as our corporate loyalty as fellow soldiers of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. What an incredible study. You are a great student of the word. Thank you. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at belt and breastplate. We start to actually look at the individual weapons of warfare that the church as an army and individual Christians, I love how you brought out the dual application there, were engaged in warfare against Satan. Warfare against false teachings and deceptions. Warfare against misinterpretation of the Word of God or misrepresentation of the character of God. Outside influences of immorality and covetousness and pride, that's just plain sin. Inside influences of jealousy and striving for supremacy and unforgiveness, that's just plain sin. Mm -hmm. The battle for the character of God in these last days, the representation of the character of God. So let's look at the belt and breastplate. I have one verse. We're in Ephesians 6, verse 14, we'll read the one verse. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're gonna actually divide this into four parts. We're gonna first look at stand, then the girding aspect, then we'll look at the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So let's start with stand. 
The Bible says, stand therefore. Now we've discussed this before. This is the fourth time in the passage we're told to stand. It's not a relaxed posture, is it, Pastor James? It's not where you just sit back, well, I'm just, I'm ready for conflict and we're ready to take a nap, Pastor Johnny. No, to stand is to be ready, mm -hmm. to be vigorously engaged in battle. It's to be on the alert, ready to employ every weapon we have in close order combat. Takeaway number one, you and I need to be mentally prepared for battle. We need to be ready. We need to be on the alert. Both individual Christians and the church as a body need to be mentally ready for battle. I think of Paul in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. What does he say? Preach the word. Be ready. Be ready, or King James says, be instant, mm -hmm. in season and out of season. Don't be mentally lax. Be prepared. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Jumping down to verse 5. But you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So many times, what do preachers do? What do church members do? Oh, peace and safety. Everything's fine. We become complacent. We're to stand. We're to be mentally ready for battle. What about the girding aspect? It says we are to having girded your waist with truth. In ancient times, this is the times when Paul was writing, they were loose fitting garments that were tied up at the waist before they went into work or before they went to battle. The Roman, Roman legionnaires, now Paul would have been familiar with them, they wore a leather military belt with a decorative belt plate and buckle and leather straps hanging, hung from the belt. They were covered with metal discs. They formed like an apron around the waist part. The apron was served to tie up the garments and hold other items in place. This was preparation for battle. You know, it's interesting. In the Word of God, when a belt is loosened, it indicates inaction or a relaxed posture. This is Isaiah 5, verse 27. This is speaking of the Assyrian army. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt on their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals be broken. When the belt was on and they were girded, that meant they were ready for what was to come. You know, even speaking of the Messiah, Jesus, we're in Isaiah 11, verse 5, we see this. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. Faithfulness, the belt of his waist. Takeaway number two, you and I need to be physically ready for battle. Not only do we need to stand and be mentally prepared for battle, we need to be physically ready for battle. We need to gird up our loins, as it were, gird up those garments in order to be physically ready for battle. Is there anything you need to do in your life prior to engaging in battle? Are there sins that need to be forgiven? Wrongs that need to be righted? restitution that needs to be made, relationships that need to be healed, addictions that need to be broken, victories that need to be gained. We need to do the work to be ready for battle. Now let's talk about this belt of truth. We're to be girded, we're to be physically ready, but with what? The belt of truth. You and I need to experience the truth, not just mentally assent to the truth. The truth isn't to remain abstract without transforming the life of the believer. Mm -hmm. We are to put on the truth. Mm -hmm. That means we wear it. Mm -hmm. We experience mm -hmm. the truth. Takeaway number three, experience the truth. This is for individual Christians and for the church as a whole. The lesson says this, I love this quote. We do not so much possess God's truth as God's truth 
possesses and protects us. Amen. You know, we can say, oh yeah, I got this, I got this, I know the Word of God, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist yes. Christian, I'm a third generation Seventh-day mm -hmm. Adventist and I pay tithe and I keep the Sabbath. But have you experienced the truth? Mm -hmm. Have you literally put on truth? Mm -hmm. Do you know by practical experience mm -hmm. what it is to know and experience the truth mm -hmm. as it is in Jesus? And that takes us to takeaway number four, experience Jesus. You can't experience the truth without experiencing Jesus for yourself. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. That means you and I have to experience Jesus. Now let's look at the breastplate of righteousness. We're still in verse 14. We stand, we're mentally ready for battle. We're girded, we're physically ready for battle. And we experience the truth. We're wearing the belt of truth. We know the truth. The truth has possessed us and you and I have experienced Jesus. Then having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now soldiers of Paul's day wore body armor and it was made of one of three things, mail, which would be small intertwined iron rings, or scale armor, which is small overlapping scales of bronze or iron, or they wore bands of overlapping iron fastened together. The point is they wore something that protected the heart, the vital organs from being penetrated by a fiery dart an arrow or a spear or something else. Isaiah 59, 17, I love this. He, this is speaking of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Christ wearing this, this weaponry as the divine warrior. Takeaway number five, accept the righteousness of Christ over your life. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Understand that our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags and understand that you and I need to be clothed. I love the analogy in Zechariah chapter three. Mm -hmm. We see Joshua mm -hmm. and what's, what garments is he in? Filthy mm -hmm. garments mm -hmm. and they're to be taken away and he's to be clothed mm -hmm. with the righteousness of Christ. Christ's righteousness is to cover the life of the believer and the church as a whole. His imputed righteousness, it justifies us. His imparted righteousness, it sanctifies us. And his righteousness protects us in the battle against Satan. Romans 5 verse 17, final scripture. If by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, meaning when Adam sinned, we're all under the curse and the penalty of death and the law. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. How? Through the one, Jesus Christ. You and I cannot be righteous of our own account. We look to Jesus, the perfect spotless Lamb of God, and He covers us with His righteousness, mm -hmm. and we begin to be prepared mm -hmm. for battle. Amen, Woo. amen. Thank you, Jill. Keep your belts tightened, and we'll be right back with the rest of our study. Uh Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study in Ephesians, Waging Peace. We turn it over to John Denzi. Thank you so much. Yes, we are now on Tuesday, Shoes, The Church Wages Peace. I read to you from the lesson, Dr. McVeigh brings this out. A Roman soldier preparing for battle would tie on a pair of sturdy military sandals. A multi-layer sole featured rugged hobnails, helping the soldier hold his ground and stand. Ephesians 6, 11, 13, and 14. Paul explains this military footwear with language from Isaiah 52, 7, which celebrates the moment when a messenger brings the news 
that Yahweh's battle on behalf of his people is won. Isaiah 52, 8 through 10. And peace now reigns. Mm -hmm. And so Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Isaiah 52, 7. This is the gospel of peace. This is what the Lord has given to us. Isaiah 52, 8 through 10 says, Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together your waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. We have a great privilege and opportunity to take the gospel of peace everywhere. Uh, you know, this is uh, something we need to consider. John 16, 33, words of Jesus. Notice what he says. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And this is something we need to remember and keep in mind that, hey, we're in this world, we're gonna have tribulation, we're gonna have troubles from time to time, but be of good cheer, Jesus has overcome the world. Yeah. And the future for us is a wonderful future, a future of peace and happiness. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, notice these words. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. Uh, there was a time, perhaps, you're a Christian, I don't know for how long, that you walked according to whatever the world was doing, whatever your friends were doing, whatever uh, temptation came your way, you went that way. But it says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. This is the way you walk before. You know, it's interesting that, I don't know if it's happened to you. I think it's happened to everybody. Mm -hmm. It's happened to me many times. It's happened to everybody. You know, you're, you put on your shoes and you're walking along and all of a sudden you feel something in your shoes. <laughs> and you don't, you're not comfortable. There's a, there's a little rock in there. You don't know how it got there. There's a little rock in there. And that's happened to me. It's like, you have to stop and get this thing out. And uh, I've been amazed when I get this thing on, and it's a tiny, little, minute, maybe grain of, a grain of sand or something, but it bothered you. Mm. Question, can you really be at peace if you're walking along with a little piece of rock in your shoes? Mm. No, you can't. Likewise, I say to you that if you have just one sin that you fall into all the time, mm -hmm. you're not really going to be at peace. Mm -hmm. You got to get that thing out of your life. And he is, Jesus Christ is he the one. He's the one that can get that out of your life. So Ephesians chapter two, verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace right. who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Jesus is the one. Uh, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Jesus is the one that makes peace. Now this, this verse has been explained very well by Sister Shelley Quinn, I think it was in, in a previous lesson, so we're not gonna take the time to do that. Uh, we need to move to Ephesians chapter two, verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. This is Jesus and this mission is passed on to us. We are to take the gospel far and near, the gospel of peace. Ephesians chapter four, verse three. It says, endeavoring, that means making an effort. We have to make an effort. effort. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We all must work towards unity. The devil is working towards division. And it's amazing to me as I've gone through life and seen uh, how some little thing the devil brings in among the brethren or even among families that divide them, little things. And you say, how can yeah. this little thing cause division? 
Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. The devil wants to divide God's people. Mm -hmm. Oh, we now move to Ephesians 6.15, from which this uh, day is lesson, the lesson of today is taken. And this says uh, in Ephesians 6.15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at this verse, I find it very interesting that they, they put the gospel of peace, Paul put the gospel of peace as the, your feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We must be Christians all the time. Amen. Not when you go into church, Amen. that's when you're a Christian. Uh, we must be a Christian all the time. Wherever we go, we must take the gospel of peace with us. Wherever we go, Jesus must be in our hearts and not put on faces, not put on masks. Oh, I'm a Christian. Stepping out of church, you take off your Christian clothes, you take off your Christian uh, attitude, and now you become like a little devil out there doing whatever comes your way. No, the gospel of peace is on the feet so that wherever you go, you're a Christian, you bring the light of the Lord, the Lord shines through you and others are blessed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that when, if, you're, if we're all in a dark room and a little light is lit, all are blessed by it. Mm -hmm. All can see that little light. Mm -hmm. And for those that are walking in darkness, we, you and I, as Christians, should be that light mm -hmm. that as they look around at all over the place that maybe friends that are not Christians, family that are not Christians, you can be that light. Mm -hmm. You can be that person that helps that individual to understand that there is a better way. Mm -hmm. There's a better way. You know, I have seen peace in the faces of people, mainly in little children. And I remember the first little child that I saw, it was the daughter of Sister Blanca in Chicago. And I said, there's something about this. She has this peace. And I would see other babies crying. But this little girl seemed to have like a continual peace. I don't know if I've ever saw her really crying, but peace. But I've also seen this in God's children to say, hey, that person has peace. And this has been a drawing factor uh, in people. I remember, I remember uh, being uh, somewhere with a, one of our fellow workers and uh, as we were working there, a lady that met us, they said, hey, this, this, this worker of you, this friend of yours, he projects peace. Mm -hmm. And I say, praise the Lord mm -hmm. that people can see a difference in God's people. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23. It says, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we have peace in Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There's a painting. Uh, you, you may have seen it. There's this, uh, the artist, I don't know how that idea came to him, but there's a painting of Jesus. Uh, uh, what, is, what is that called when you're in a ship and you're... Captain? He's the captain of the ship, but he's, he's the one uh, taking this boat to safety and there's this storm all around and uh, the waves are high and there's thunder and lightning apparently in this. And the people that are close to Jesus have this trust mm -hmm. and this peace because who is the one at the wheel? At the wheel. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when we know that Jesus is the, at the wheel of our lives, mm -hmm. we shall trust and we know that we will have his peace. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. James. And thank you, Jill and John. What a wonderful lesson. Wednesday's lesson is the shield, the helmet, and the sword. These are three pieces of armor to protect our mind. My name is Shelley Quinn, and I just want to remind you, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Our battle is against the evil powers that are in the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavens. Our battle is against 
Satan and his unholy alliance of fallen angels, demons, and the battleground, guess what? It's your mind. Let me read this to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 in the Amplified. Ooh, it makes it so real. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we walk or live in the flesh, we're not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God. For, here's the purpose of these weapons, for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Where are these strongholds? Inasmuch as, now, Listen to this and you'll know where the strongholds are. We refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. The strongholds are in our mind. And it says, we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ. The battleground is your mind. Mm -hmm. So Ephesians 6, 16 and 17 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So look, let's look at those three. The shield of faith is when we are counting on God's promises of divine protection and peace in the midst of the storm. And we take our thoughts captive and we extinguish the fiery darts of the devil with the shield of faith. Hmm. When one of my favorite verses, Genesis 15, 1, God came to Abraham and he said, do not fear. Mm -hmm. I am your shield mm -hmm. and your exceedingly great <laughs> reward. Right. And it's like, oh, I love that. I claim that all the time. Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. Little word, little faith. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that, mm -hmm. little word, little faith. What we've got to do, and remember in Romans, I mean, Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is possible to please the Lord because we've got to believe in God and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So, and, and one more, 2 Corinthians 1 20, one of my favorite, all of That's God's right. promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. He is the surety of the everlasting covenant. So we find the yes answer to God's promises in Christ. If you're in Christ, you can claim those promises. Now here's something that's interesting. I didn't know this till I read the lesson. Roman legionnaires would take their wooden shields. They were often covered with leather, but they would soak them in water before going out to battle. And that would help quench the fiery darts. The shield was curved. It was maneuverable. You know, you could, if the attack was coming, it was curved where it kind of protects you from the side. But if you knew the enemy was coming from the left, you could turn your shield more to the left. It was a maneuverable thing. But, you know, I was thinking about this. They soaked it in water. What did Jesus tell us in John 7, 37 and 39? On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood. He cried out and he says, let him who thirsts come to me and I will give him, he who believes in me out of his heart will flow streams of living water. And then it says in verse 39, he spoke this concerning the Spirit. If you want your shield of faith to be one that will quench the fiery darts of, of the devil, it's got to be soaked in the Word 
and by the Holy Spirit. Now, the helmet of salvation is to protect the believer's mind. Satan constantly seeks to cause doubt and confusion. That's his MO. He, he tells 80% of the truth, 90% of the truth with just 10% of a lie in there. So it's all, it's all a lie. But when, what I see more than anything is that people are going, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be ready for Jesus' return. I don't think I'm, I'm not saved. I don't. Did you know what? If you're abiding in Christ, you can have assurance of your salvation. I'm not talking once saved, always saved, but as long as you remain in Christ, guess what? The Bible says you are saved and that is your helmet of salvation. First John 10 through uh, five, first John five verses 10 through 13. He who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him out to lie, to be a liar. If you don't believe his gift is salvation by grace through righteousness, by faith, you're saying, oh God, I think of you as a liar because he's not believed the testimony that God has given him his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. Now listen to verse 12. He who has the son of life, mm. if you have Jesus living in your heart by faith, he says, he who has the son has life. That's right. He who does not have the son does not have life. Mm -hmm. And then John concludes in verse 13 saying, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know you have eternal life right. and that you may continue to believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, we're to be tenderhearted. Yes, we need to do spiritual inventory. Yes, we need to make sure that we're abiding in Christ. But when you're in Christ, you have total assurance of your salvation. Amen. Now the sword of the spirit. This is one of my favorite. This is the final our item of armor, and it refers, it, it, it's Paul is referring to the, the Roman legionnaire had this short two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The first edge struck when God speaks it. The second edge strikes when we speak it. It's piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword of the spirit is supplied by the spirit. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it's the word of God, but John 14, 26 says, the helper, the Holy Spirit will bring, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance. So here's what I've got to tell you. It's interesting. The Bible, Jesus Christ, are referred to as the Lagos Word of God, L-O-G-O-S, the Lagos, the full revelation of God. Paul does not use the word Lagos here when he says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. He uses the word rhema, and rhema means that you are personally applying it. Personally, because of that, I don't believe that this is the sword of the Spirit. I believe that the Bible is the sheath that holds the sword. The sword of the spirit is the, the verses you know that you're personally applying, that you pull out and you can say to Satan, uh-uh, it is written. And with three bold swipes, you are claiming the promises of God. Your Bible holds all of these rhema promises, but not until you apply them personally can these promises bring you victory in the battle. Amen. All right. I'm Daniel Perrin. Thursday's lesson is practicing battlefield prayer. And we've just been encouraged to take up each of these weapons of our armor. And then Paul comes to prayer. And maybe you've heard it said like this, much prayer, much power. Yes. Little prayer, little, little power. power. No prayer, no power. 
And maybe you've experienced that in your own life. Uh, Paul here turns to prayer and he doesn't connect it with any symbolic weaponry as he did with each of the previous items because prayer is interlaced with each one of them. I can't imagine having righteousness without prayer Amen. or faith not accompanied by prayer. Amen. Presenting the gospel of, of peace, the truth, understanding and applying the word of God, that doesn't happen without prayer. Let's look at the text that Paul uses here in chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always mm -hmm. with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So let me ask you a question. Do you pray? Mm. It may seem like an unusual question with a, a given answer, but it's a vital question. We take for granted that prayer is important, but I think if we knew the truth of the lives of Christians attending churches, we might be surprised how few people pray. You may be unable to read the Bible for some reason, but we must pray. Mm -hmm. Even the thief on the cross uttered a prayer and his prayer was answered, Amen. which is why Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. And seeking sounds like an I word, like I'm, I'm, I'm looking with my eyes, but the next phrase tells us, call upon him while he is near. Do we neglect anything our earthly success depends upon as much as we neglect prayer? Mm -hmm. We pay our bills. Mm -hmm. We get to work on time. We complete our chores. We make plans for the future and for vacations. We do market research to see which appliance would be the best one to buy and the greatest value for our money. We're convinced of the value of education and we invest time and money and research and, and we aim to have a well-disciplined and balanced mind. But if we want those things, we cannot have them apart from prayer. Mm -hmm. Do you have friends or family and you want to exert some influence in their life? Prayer is what will lead you to that influence. Mm -hmm. Do you have some talent that God has given you? Prayer will largely determine whether or not that talent will become a blessing or a curse in your life. Are there possessions or money that God has placed under your stewardship and you want to use them rightly so that they don't own you? Mm -hmm. God says, bring those things to me in prayer. So I'm not asking, do you say your prayers or do you bow your head before each meal? Or do you listen and have your heart moved when prayers are, are spoken in church? Or do you occasionally formally call upon God and, and open a meeting with prayer when asked to? Or do you cry out to God in the midst of a disaster? Do you pray? Friend to friend, whispering intimate words into his ear that no one else will ever be allowed to hear. Lingering there in sweet communion longing for that friendship, enjoying it, reluctant to say farewell like, like lovers at a gate and they can't say goodbye, cherishing every moment that you spend alone with God. Rather to miss work and food than have to miss that time alone with God. And then we hurry away from human interaction when the work is done, when our chores are done, longing to get back to that one we love the most, to hear his counsel, his reproof, his companionship, and his love. Do you pray? There's all kinds of prayers, group prayer, public prayer, short, brief prayers called out in the midst of a situation. But we are called especially to secret prayer. This is part of unceasing prayer. And this morning, when a few of us gathered for worship before the day began, as a part of our worship, we sang that well-loved song, I come to the garden alone. Alone. Messages to young people, page 268. Unless, unless you think it's not for you, I think the cutoff age for young people is about 150 or so. So it says... <laughs> 268 says, do not neglect secret prayer, for it is the soul of religion. With earnest, fervent prayer, plead for purity of soul. Plead as earnestly, as eagerly as you would for your mortal life were it at stake. Remain before God until unutterable longings are begotten within you for salvation. As I read this, I'm desiring this. I'm wanting more of this. And the sweet evidence is obtained of pardoned sin. 
Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Our relationship with Jesus can be gauged by where we pray. Are we conscious of him only at bedtime, mealtime, or emergencies? It could be just a meaningless habit if that's alone where we pray. But I can't imagine a person who's, who prays everywhere and prayer is not a vital reality for them. It's a secret door that we open and it's always open at the end of heaven. Is it open for us at this end? You awaken in the morning and the battle's already raging. Battlefield prayer, the battle is already raging before the weather check, before the scrolling of social media, before the checking of anything else. Check in with God. Bring your life to Him. And how wide is the battlefield? It encompasses all your experiences. We turn to God in emergencies as we should, but imagine the difference between someone who turns to God in an emergency whose life has been one of consistent prayer versus one for whom it's just been a formal habit. It'd be like groping in the dark, longing for something you're not sure of. How often we say our prayers and then 10 minutes later, we don't remember what we said. No wonder we call out to God in distress sometimes and we wonder, God, are you even hearing my prayer? Our prayer is to embrace gratitude for the common courtesies that God gives us. The physical things and the spiritual things, rest, peace, assurance of salvation through Jesus. And our prayer is to be a battle over sin. That God says, bring your sin to me and allow me to examine your heart. Search me and try me. Yeah. Psalm 139 verse 23. And know my anxieties. And see, Lord, if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in your way of, of everlasting life. And God allows us to face trouble in our life, to make us conscious and aware of our great need for him. And that's his invitation in Psalm 50 verse 15. Call upon me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Amen. Do, you know, do you know somebody who needs Christ? Mm -hmm. There's no greater privilege than to pray for them. Amen. Amen. To be drawn into that experience is crucial responsibility. There's endless reasons that we could enumerate. We could go through your entire life and that's what God wants you to do. Look at your entire life, every single moment, every single step and, and look for the opportunity to pray as Paul did in Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known for God, to God. God does not begrudge your requests. You don't trouble him with the things you ask. You trouble him when you do not ask. Mm -hmm. Why don't they trust me with their issues, with their problems? Mm -hmm. I, I wanna conclude here with, uh, with what Paul asks us to pray for. He's in prison and you might not be surprised or, or, or be, you might not be surprised if he says, pray that the district attorney, attorney deals kindly with me. Pray that the, that the person in charge of the jail gives me comfort. Pray that I get out of jail quickly. Uh, pray for those things. But he says, pray for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. That in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak because this is the great battle. It's the battle of the knowledge of God. And Paul says, when you pray for me, not just for the physical needs, all right, lift those up to God, but pray for the spiritual need, the lifting up of the standard against the enemy that I may be able to do it boldly. And so God advises us, come to me, not just when you're in trouble, not just when life is tough, come to me when life is good. I'll share with you one more quote here from the book Prayer. There are few of us, this is page eight, who rightly appreciate or improve the precious privilege of prayer. We should go to Jesus and tell him all our needs. We may bring him our little cares and perplexities as well as our great troubles. Whatever arises to disturb or distress us, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. Whatever it is, that's our battlefield strength. Amen. 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 We've just got a few minutes left for some closing thoughts. We'll start with Jill. My heart is really full today. Mm -hmm. I just... 
I was overwhelmed as I listened to each person share um, mm -hmm. what God has given us as mm -hmm. Christians in the battle, mm -hmm. the incredible weapons that are mm -hmm. at our disposal. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage you, make Jesus your everything and mm -hmm. engage in that warfare. Amen. 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 There is an undeniable reality in Isaiah 48, 22. It says, there's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be, neither let it be afraid. This is what Jesus wants to do for each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Just to always remember that the battleground is for your mind. Don't let the devil pick up or set up strongholds there. Pick up that shield of faith, mm -hmm. soaked in the Word, soaked in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Pick up, put on that helmet of salvation. Know you can trust God. And remember the sword of the Spirit. The Bible contains all of these promises. The sword of the Spirit is the promise you can personally apply. So get to know God's promises. Amen. Amen. The pathway to the throne of God is open. Amen. It's always open. And we are invited to step onto that pathway with our thoughts, with our words, and call out to God. And maybe you feel like, I don't really know how to pray. I'm not good at it. Do what the disciples of Jesus did. He said, Lord, teach us to pray and then trust him. Go to Matthew chapter 6 and Jesus there gives some instruction on how to pray. And he tells us then again in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks him? Ask God for that. Start there and then trust him as he teaches you in his word. Amen. Amen. Well, this week's lesson is over and we're going to be looking in uh, next week at our very last lesson. It's called Ephesians in the Heart, lesson number 14. Unusual that we have 14 lessons in a quarter, but every once in a while we do that. Daniel said that uh, there's no time when we shouldn't pray or couldn't pray, so I thought it would be appropriate for us to go out of this session in a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for each one of our viewers. And we know there are people out there who are in need of prayer, people who are struggling in this battle, the spiritual battle, people who have no armor on or just very little armor on. And we just want to lift them up right now in each one of us. And we just want to pray and ask that you will step in between us and the enemy, that you will fortify us, that you will cover us with Christ's righteousness, that you will fill us with the Spirit, and you will guide our hearts and mind to Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.